Welcome to Tech Orbit. Enjoy this super video and don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss the next ones. This is the most important rocket in the world, successfully launching to orbit 96 times in the year 2023. The SpaceX Falcon 9 has created a new era in human spaceflight, but the Falcon 9 also represents one of the biggest gambles in aerospace. History a make-or-break product for SpaceX that was much more likely to fail than it was to succeed. And for Elon Musk's band of ambitious young rocket scientists, there would be plenty of failure along the way, countless setbacks and revisions as they worked tirelessly. To achieve the impossible for SpaceX, there was one driving force behind it all. And this is the real reason SpaceX developed the Falcon 9. We all know that Elon Musk's reason reason behind founding SpaceX was to colonize Mars and make human life. Interplanetary, that story is well known, so let's talk specifically about how Falcon 9 was developed to support that overarching goal, because you obviously can't just shoot straight for a Mars colony on your first shot. You have to start from the bottom and establish the foundations of an interplanetary spaceflight industry. The problem that SpaceX had to solve with Falcon 9 was the extremely high cost cost of putting stuff into outer space. The established pricing structure back in the space shuttle days was that it would cost around $10,000 to put one kilogram of mass into low Earth orbit. And when you scale that up to the cost of sending an entire city to the planet Mars, the result is obviously going to be significantly more than any government is willing or even able to. Peso, the primary objective with the Falcon rocket program was to drastically reduce the cost of putting mass into orbit. The fastest and most effective way to accomplish this was pretty obvious stop making single-use rockets every time that we launch a conventional rocket. The majority of the structure ends up plummeting into the ocean or smashing into the desert if you're in Russia. Either way, months and even years worth of highly complex engineering work is converted into garbage after about 90 seconds of use. That's bad. So all we need to do is make a rocket that is fully reusable and it will eliminate the majority of costs associated with launching to space. How hard could it be now if we're going to have a rocket? That is low cost, reliable and reusable. Then the first thing we need is an engine that ticks all of those boxes as well. So we arrive at the first production rocket engine from SpaceX. The Merlin we saw a few different iterations of the Merlin design as SpaceX progressed with. Their initial Falcon 1 rocket testing the Merlin 1C was the engine that powered the first successful Falcon 1 launch and went on to be used in the first five flights of the Falcon 9 SpaceX is currently using the Merlin 1D engine across their full line of Falcon. 9 and Falcon Heavy Boosters, the design of the Merlin engine was a product of the chaotic early days in the life of SpaceX to have a private tech startup company from California. Enter into the field of orbital rocket launches was absolutely outrageous back in the early. 2000s unprecedented. No one thought that they would succeed, and therefore no one was investing any money in the project. Elon Musk was self-financing the whole thing with his PayPal fortune, which was a lot of money. But SpaceX was burning through cash as fast as they were. Burning rocket fuel. So Elon's mission statement for the Merlin was to build a rocket engine as simple and cheap as possible. What they settled on was an open-cycle gas generator system powered by a combination of cryogenic liquid oxygen and refined kerosene also known as Rocket Propellant 1 or just RP-1. A gas generator is very simply just a miniature rocket engine that burns a small amount of fuel and oxidizer to spin a turbine that powers the ANG's main pumps. The exhaust gas from the generator is dumped out from the side of the engine hence the term open cycle by combining the gas generator fuel pump and oxygen pump all on one drive shaft. The Merlin has a mechanically simple design that is also highly effective and by opting for a cheap and accessible RPB1. Fuel instead of a more logistically complicated molecule like hydrogen. SpaceX kept the cost of operating the Merlin to about as low as it gets something that SpaceX had envisioned from the very start of their development with the Falcon. One rocket was recovering and reusing both the first stage booster and the upper stage vehicle by having them execute a propulsive return to launch site and landing maneuver. Now they gave up on recovering the second stage pretty early on, and that's a reasonable concession to make, because with a conventional rocket, the upper section is a relatively simple vehicle. That consists of just one engine, a couple of small fuel tanks and a platform that holds the payload until it's time to deploy. 
but recovering the first stage booster is a much more valuable proposition, as long as you can make that booster fully reusable and then fly it often enough to make the extra effort worthwhile. Of course, SpaceX opted for the most technically challenging recovery method there is, the propulsive landing. This was unprecedented territory, one common question that people ask about Falcon 9. Why didn't SpaceX just use parachutes to recover the booster? It worked for the space shuttle, right? Well, the short answer is they tried, but physics wouldn't allow it. Parachuting the shuttle boosters worked for two reasons. One, they were pretty small and pretty light being solid rocket boosters once, all of the propellant is burned up. They're basically just empty metal tubes, and two, the shuttle boosters separated at a relatively low altitude, and therefore a relatively low velocity of just around 4,800 kemph. They were only really necessary to get the shuttle off the ground and through the thickest part of the atmosphere. After that, the shuttle still had three incredibly powerful hydrogen, burning 25 rupees engines that continue pushing to reach orbital velocity in a single core. Two-stage rocket like the Falcon 9, that one booster has to impart a tremendous amount of velocity into the upper stage so that the final vacuum engine can continue to accelerate the payload into orbit. This means the Falcon booster will fly much higher and faster, reaching a speed over 8,000 kmpf at stage separation. The formula for kinetic energy is 1-2 mass time velocity squared, which in the case of a Falcon 9 booster that just released an orbital payload equals way too much energy for any parachute to withstand. In theory, SpaceX could have still used parachutes in a hybrid system, letting the booster engines perform their boost back burn to kill off that excess kinetic energy until it was safe enough to parachute. But this is Elon Musk philosophy we're talking about. Now the best part is no part the rocket already has engines, so why bother adding parachutes to lower velocity when the engines can do the exact same thing? The engines on the Falcon 9 also serve a dual purpose as a free heat shield to protect the booster as it re-enters the atmosphere. So in the case of a drone ship landing scenario, the Falcon 9 booster is going to coast up and clear through the atmosphere crossing over the Kármán line and technically being in space for about a minute or so. But since it's not traveling at orbital velocity, the booster is eventually going to fall back down. As this begins to happen, the booster is going to flip around and point its engines in the opposite direction to perform a re-entry burn. The maneuver is going to start killing off a ton of the booster's velocity, which is important, but even more critical. The thrust from the engines will create a force field underneath the rocket that protects the metal from the extreme heat of re-entry, that's when you see the crazy jellyfish looking cloud of smoke and fire build up underneath the rocket. As it's coming back down, it looks awesome then. The booster will coast down through the atmosphere, losing more velocity to friction as it's guided in by aerodynamic grid fence at the last moment. The engines will reignite one more time to make sure that the booster velocity reaches zero at the moment that the landing legs touch down on the floating platform. This is a procedure that SpaceX has now repeated well over on times in these days. They make it look pretty easy, but that was not always the case. It took SpaceX a lot of trial and error and multiple upgrade cycles to the Falcon 9 before they could truly stick. The landing. Most people might not realize that the Falcon 9 was not a genuine reusable rocket until SpaceX achieved its final form in 2018, known as the Block 5 Most Rockets don't really continue going through an active development cycle. Once they begin operation, the design they have on the first successful launch more than likely is going to be what they stick with throughout the life cycle of the product. And that's because rockets are very temperamental and dangerous vehicles. Anytime you change a design, you introduce an unknown variable, which could then in turn lead to a failure, and no one wants that. Unless you're SpaceX, another bit of Elon philosophy, if things are not failing, you are not innovating. Enough, now let's start with the Falcon 9 version 1. The first iteration of this rocket was actually a lot smaller at just about 46M in total length, and so a lot less powerful at just 1.1 million pounds of thrust, even though SpaceX had already intended to make Falcon 9 a reusable booster. This version didn't receive any of the necessary grid fins or landing legs to make that possible. They wanted to make sure that it went up properly before they thought too much about getting it back down. You can identify this early version by the square engine layout with three rows of 
Three nozzles. This Falcon 9 flew five missions, including one to send a cargo Dragon capsule to the ISS. Next up is the Falcon 9 version 1.1. This variant grew significantly to over 68M in length. It was the first to utilize the Merlin 1D engine and the circular Octa web engine layout. This increased the total thrust to 1.3 million pounds. That extra size and power made this the first Falcon 9 capable of a controlled return to Earth because it could get a payload into orbit with Enough fuel left over to perform the necessary re-entry, and landing burn SpaceX began experimenting with this capability in small-scale tests, where they would attempt to bring the rocket down for soft landings over the open ocean. It wasn't until the CRS-3 mission. To resupply the ISS in April 2014 that the Falcon 9 received its first set of landing legs, and then for CRS-5 in January 2015, the first set of grid fins were added to achieve more precise control when free falling through the atmosphere. This gave SpaceX the confidence to attempt their first ever drone ship landing on that same flight. It didn't work, but they got surprisingly close for something that was thought to be genuine. Eli impossible at the time, none of the version 1.1 rockets ever successfully landed, and then in June 2015, the Falcon 9 experienced a mid-air failure and broke apart. This gave SpaceX enough pause to shut down Falcon 9 operations until they were able to come back with another revision to the booster design version. 1.2 is also sometimes referred to as the Falcon 9 full thrust, just slightly longer now, reaching 70M in length and gaining a massive increase in power to 1.7 million PBS of thrust. Most of this power gain came from SpaceX cooling, both their liquid oxygen and rocket fuel to lower temperatures, which increases their energy density. This is where SpaceX really followed through on their promise to learn through failure, because the first launch of the Falcon 9 full thrust also marked the first successful landing of an orbital rocket booster in the history of spaceflight, with the booster touching down onto a SpaceX landing pad at Cape Canaveral. The full thrust went through a series of small tweaks and variations over the years as SpaceX prepared to finalize the rocket into its ultimate form. The reason that they had to do this was in order to get the Falcon 9 crew rated by NASA. It's fine to play around with variables when there is only money and equipment on the line, but once it's agreed that a rocket is safe to carry human beings, then you have to stop messing with it so we arrive at the Falcon 9 Block 5, it's the exact same size as the previous version, and only slightly more powerful at 1.8 million pounds of total thrust. The most obvious visual cue to identify these variants is the black paint in the middle, and on the landing legs, the real upgrades here are. Being made to increase the overall reusability of the rocket booster, the Falcon 9 full thrust was refurbished in some situations, but for, for the most part, SpaceX only recovered those boosters, they didn't actually reuse them very often. The first SpaceX launch to use a refurbished Falcon 9 happened in March 2017. That's it for today's video. Don't forget to subscribe, like, comment and activate the notification bell so you don't miss any videos. See you soon.